There we go. Welcome to episode one, two, three. Hey, I didn't notice that before. We just started. 123, where uh, we have a special guest in Alexei, about who's going to talk about 10 things I like about Quarkers, which I'm looking forward to. We always like good things. Um, but before, we'll just give a, a, a quick update on news. Uh, so we had the beta one of Quarkers, uh, Quarkers 3, sorry, coming out last week. And I'm just noticing that our we are not connected to the internet. Why are we not? Well, let's see if it goes. Um, so if anyone can hear us, please say it on chat. Because right now we look like we are, there's no one here. It's a bit funny. Uh, anyway, uh, the the news in, in better one is that we got the highly reactive back in. Uh, maybe that was even now. I can't remember. But uh, we're getting closer to a CI1. Uh, but even more fun is uh, we have a new page on Quarks IO, which I know Holly is dying to talk about. So if Holly, if you want to show off, yeah, I can um, share my screen. There we go. Oh, not yet. Not yet. Yep. No. Uh, let's see, we have. Okay, people are starting coming in. That's good. Yeah. So you just know in the year 2050, sharing screens is still going to be <laughs> the biggest challenge in computer science. Well, I can share mine too if you want to be. Yeah, well, I mean, I sh it should be there just to to um, make visible. Here we go. Yay. No, that's that's your screen, yeah. isn't it? You said on my screen, so uh, you, ah. you can talk from my from. Uh... Cool. So if you go to Quarkus IO, um, there's a new section on the top which says extensions, because um, one of the things that we've been wanting for a while is just a way, uh, an extension catalog, a way to sort of browse extensions, because we're getting more and more extensions in Quarkus, and it's quite useful to sort of be able to see what's out there, to be able to search them. Um, so the new page that we have. Um, is this and you can search so you can filter um, and then if you find an extension that you like the look of if you click on it um, then you can see more detail so you can get a link to the documentation you can get a link to the source code so if you want to raise 62 issues against the extension because you're feeling malicious um, well then please don't do that but if you wanted to you could um, or if you wanted to be community spirited and raise a pull request against the extension instead you could do that um, and you can just sort of see like what categories we have extensions in um, and see when they were last released, make sure an extension is up to date if you're thinking about using it, see what the status is so that you can see if it's stable or if you're looking at something that's in um, preview mode, um, get a cut and pasteable command to install it. Um, and we're continuing to add more to this. So if there's something that you'd like to see, um, then the one, the one repo that we don't have a link to actually is the repo for this site. Um, but if you if you would like to see something, um, then please do feel free to to raise an issue or reach out to me and let me know. And maybe just to tell people that, that why, why people are like why why are we not using code quarkers for this the the coding here and this is a subtle difference than people might not realize is that on here is only the extensions that are available for that specific stream you have here, um, and. That's all the best intention. That when you go and click here, you will always get an application that is for that thing. Uh, and the idea here with the extensions here is that that here can be. This doesn't matter what version of Quarkus it's targeting, or you can always find it, and you'll always be told which version of Quarkus you can use it with. We we default to latest. Um, but yeah, so it's it's a way to uh, and and uh, yeah, basically give an overview and, and recognize anyone who's doing stuff in the Quarkus land. And uh, yeah, if there's somehow a link that's missing between the two, then that's a, that's just us not having done it yet. And we'll if you report it, then we'll fix it. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, you can um, you can use this to drive code.quarkus though. So if you click yeah. on yeah, so you, there if you've got that, try that this extension, and then that will take you to code.quarkus that has been pre warmed with this extension, so that you can you can go from one to the other. Yeah, correct. Cool, awesome. 
But let me turn on my own screen here. There you go. And uh, voila. So, but that was the news. And as always, uh, in this, we have the chat going. And if you have questions uh, to, well, like say, we'll talk about it in a few minutes. Or anything in Caucus, yeah, put a question and we'll fit it in. Feed it in. Feed it in. Sorry. Cool. Well, Alexei, now you, you are the, the big screen on, the, sorry, big head on screen. Uh, do you want to give a quick introduction and then uh, we can get into your presentation? Yeah, sure. Thanks uh, for inviting me. Uh, it's really nice to be on stage. Um, so my name is Alexei, Alexei Pratukin. I work in Open Value. It's a consultancy company. Um, I have 15 plus experiences, uh, experience developing Java application, both as coder, developer, architect. I've done some front end as well. I recently concentrate on mostly on dev and ops side of things. And uh, as part of the team leading activities, uh, I all usually try to board in or do the onboarding uh, for the new members of the team. And this certainly involves teaching into the stack that we're using in the project. Recently, I started using Quarkus. I think it was about three to four years already ago. And I fell in love with it magically because at the time I was changing from one project to another. And one of the reasons to change the project was using Quarkus. And I will go into more details later why I was excited to try out Quarkus so much. And uh, basically what I'm going to show today um, is a set of features of Quarkus that not everybody is familiar with or that might be a reason for someone doing enterprise development for a very, very, very long time and being stuck in the same project for tens of years or maybe like five years or so uh, to change to a modern stack and uh, enjoy life finally. And, and just just to give a context, so we, we've had uh, like on Quarters Insight, we normally have, or well, normally, I'm not sure what's normal, but we, all, we focus a lot of, of new extensions and pe what people are working on or a new development in Quarkus, but time to time we try and have users or companies on. And uh, I think I'd like say you pinged us a while ago, like yes, remember, remember? And we completely missed the notification, and then we saw it in January, February. Like, wait, here's someone who wants to talk about uh, good stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, we, we thought, hey, here for Quarkus three, it'll be nice to have a reminder from someone who's not us. Uh, what's good or bad about Quarkus? So, uh, yes. And, and by the way, it's completely fine to say things you don't like. That's actually what we learned the most from. So, uh, but yeah. Well, if, if there are things I don't like, I try to raise a pull request for them. Uh, that's even the even way. better. That's the way uh, of, of developers. Yeah, but it was a weird thing. So we were at Vegas uh, on the conference with the guys, with a couple of my colleagues. Uh, some of them were giving talk there, and I ran into Erin. Erin Schnabel, and I just wanted to get some uh, feedback on what she thinks about this teaching session for new developers, and uh, she liked it, and suggested that I'll be on, on, the, on the block on, our, on the insights. So that's how it came to fruition. Right. You want to share your slide? Yes. Uh, am I not sharing yet? Yes. So you, you are. I'm just, I'll share it to the screen. So. Cool. So, yes, welcome to Quarkus Insights uh, number one to three. Uh, I changed uh, to the freedom to change the, the header, the headline of it, 10 reasons to convert you to subatomic side of force, because for me it was uh, changing, a long while ago, changing from dev to ops, and I considered it to be to change to the dark side of force. Now, yeah, subatomic side of force. So a bit of a background, why I, usually talking about Quarkus and why I like Quarkus is, is uh, I'm coming from enterprise uh, projects most of the time. And uh, yeah, so basically whenever you do some enterprise project with some legacy code base, deploying, testing new code, it might take you minutes to tens of minutes to hours. I already had this cases where we would take 30 minutes, would take us 30 minutes to redeploy a minor change, which is not something we like as developers, we want to be productive. We want to write code and see it perform on the production stage or after after we've done some additional testing, of course. 
So yes, uh, anything from one coffee to a three course dinner and this uh, things which I don't tolerate, which don't make us productive. So um, for, regarding the background, I started with Tomcat and OSGI and it was okay. Grails was, had some hot reload, but it was a bit slow, it had slow at the time. I really enjoyed Play Framework on Java back in 2000. I don't remember what year it was, but it's been a while ago. It was had some really awesome code call replacement. And uh, WebLogic, that's the project what I was, where I was talking about uh, more than 30 minutes Spring Boot. With some instrumentation, you can bring it to hot code replacement and to being productive with it, but um, it just wasn't my uh, flavor of the framework, I guess. I did some work with Payar, and um, that was a Payar project which I've been changing from to Quarkus, which has reload on next request, a feature that I like, or at that moment, I like the most. So, um, what I'll By demo way, just, just to yeah. comment say, to, on your slide before, like to play on Java, awesome. It's, it's fun because if there's one thing that we, well, we not only got inspired by some of the stuff they did, uh, uh, Stefan Warard, who works on, on Corpus, actually, oh, he, he mentioned play almost everyone. He says, hey, we, we should do this. And then there's some feature they had in play uh, from years back. So play, play is a very, it, it has been inspiration to a lot of stuff we do. In, uh, yes, uh, I guess that's the place why I like it so much yeah. right now. Because uh, uh, I think then uh, Play changed mostly to Scala. I think they do still support the Java version, but uh, they concentrate their efforts on Scala, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, I had some troubles with it. So yeah, uh, excited to was excited to to um, change from Payar to Quarkus. Uh, based on the stack, it was uh, from from at least from the from the API uh, standpoint of view, it was really similar, and I was able to migrate a huge code base as a prototype, of course, in, in a matter of days. So today, uh, I would like to demonstrate for the newcomers, of course, for those experienced Quarkus developers out there, it might seem uh, very easy. The features I like the most and the features uh, I like to advertise the most for the newcomers in any Quarkus project, in particular for the guys that uh, yeah, have stuck with application service for a while. So things for today, hot code replacement with live reload on the next request, uh, Docker native image Kubernetes remote live reload, which is, yes, a feature that uh, not everybody likes and not, every, not everybody agrees on is good, but can uh, sometimes be very helpful. Uh, I'll continue with reactive messaging, which I'm a great fan of uh, dev services, reactive JP on dev services on an example of reactive JPA testing, uh, which I enjoy the, yeah, almost the most. Um, dev UI as a chair on top. And uh, yes, I hope once I'm through with this demo, you'll be happy to jump into testing it out yourselves. I would like to use this that's also some, some more advertisement for an additional testing framework, which I'm not gonna demonstrate today due to the time constraints, but go check it out, database writer for testing uh, the database state for uh, would you, when you develop microservices, I have a small demo on it, that it would be nice to see more people using it. So that's it with regards to the slide. I hope that went to way too many slides. What do you think? Oh, sounds good. Looks good to me. <laughs> Great. Then let's get into the So here is a console, and we'll be doing a lot of things. So first, um, as far as I've concerned, is using but use it. Installed as the game and it allows you to change between different distributions uh, of SDKs and JDKs. Uh, so important for us today, uh, Maven, Java, and Quarkus command line. Um, right. So as you see, the directory is totally empty, and I will start with the demonstrating the hot code replacement. So first thing first, I will. the screen and uh, I will create the first project 
And I will do some copy pasting here uh, just to save us some time because we don't have much. So Quarkus create app, then there is the group ID, uh, the artifact ID, and uh, the command line tool is pretty neat. It also tells you what uh, extensions have been installed. In this case, we have uh, rest easy in place, and I will just change to the demo and open a window. I heard that's what the cool kids do nowadays. No more IntelliJ, only VS code. So, Quarkos generated a bunch of structures for you. And what we'll demo to turn right now is again hot code replacement. So for this, I will just start up the Quarkus F and uh, we'll see how it bootstraps. So I've tried to preload all the dependencies up front. There we go. So that we don't have to wait for the Maven dependencies to be downloaded. Let me split the screen. Uh, oh, yeah. I have to change the profile to light. I'm sorry for that. I'm a fan of the dark theme. And uh, let's do a curl, right? So, the application has been bootstrap on localhost 8080 uh, as an endpoint hello, and we get a easy. So, what's the code code replacement all about? We change hello, Max and Holly. And once we re reload, um, or once we call the endpoint again, it automatically reloads everything for us. So it doesn't do anything stupid, like trying to compile half-edited code, but instead it waits for you to uh, execute the next request. So this one works, and of course, in a larger project, it might take time to recompile the changes, but it's still usually very fast. So then let's do another thing. I've just changed a code directly. But what also works is if I would try to use the quick property uh, name equals greeting default value equals a, so this will obviously work as well, but we could just validate it. Oh yeah, that's an error, which is good. I'll have to declare the property, the actual property. And then I will just return the greeting. And again, once people come from enterprise world, they usually stand on how this works, right? So we see a change, nothing really different from what we've done till now. But what we could do now is add application property greeting equals this is Quarkus insights number one to three and it would also pick up the changes from the application property so basically these demos you change the code you change any configuration of your application and it gets automatically reloaded which is a pretty new thing so you don't want um, you don't have to wait for a compilation or for the build and for the deployment anymore and it don't maintain huge applications web server or an application server locally. So that's the first feature. And usually this already is something uh, that people very much start to like. Uh, but then again, getting used to all those uh, my application servers and uh, uh, getting used to deploying a var or an ear into the application server um not everybody has experience with docker so nowadays it seems like an obvious thing thing to containerize applications 
to use Docker for as a helper tool to bootstrap a couple of databases for local testing, but uh, not everybody has this experience till now. So the demo would be to demonstrate how easy it is with Quarkus to produce images. And this is the first step in the right direction, uh, which would help people to get this themselves from uh, with uh, Docker. Um, so again, this time I tried. Uh, I created the application, but I've already press, uh, tried to precede the extensions, which is REST Easy Reactive plus the container image sheet, which uses the Maven JIT plugin, I think from Google, right, um, to generate the Docker image. And yeah, selected extensions you see here. I already changed into the let's open our code and uh, again. To demonstrate how easy it is with Quarkus to start building up uh, the uh, Docker images, the only thing we have to do is go into the application properties and say we want to build a container image. That's it. And uh, sometimes it really does stun people how easy it is to, to get started with uh, with the packaging and application as a Docker image. So we would do the clean package. And uh, what uh, Quarkus will automatically do for us using the Maven JIT plugin, it uh, will create a Docker image. You have to run the package first. Uh, oh, you did. Okay. Yes, I did. So unless we've done something stupid, it should have worked and generated a image. Did you add the uh, dip? I didn't see you add the dip uh, extension. I think it was on the command line when he did the um, the um, create. Right. I've, I do remember editing it, but what could right? And, and the bombing signal, it should have the jip. Go. It does have it. That's weird. That's really weird. Given that I tested it just yesterday. <laughs> there is something about live demos. Yes, the presenter effect. Mm. Yeah, I have a theory of like audience driven testing that the, the number of people in the audience, you know, so when it's just you, it works every time. And then, you know, as soon as you have an audience, it doesn't work. And if the audience is like your VP or 200 people, then you've basically got no chance of it working. Yes, that is so true. So that is the valid directory. I'll just give it a quick shot once again, just to see what uh, things are get, get, uh, getting executed. But... It's the only thing that's different. I, I normally put it on the... Oh, there we go. This time it does build an image. So I might have clicked or pressed Control C accidentally, but uh, I don't remember doing that. Anyway. Um, you just edit it out uh, live. Yes. <laughs> Nobody saw a thing. It worked perfectly the first yeah, time. Yeah. It worked perfectly. Um, right. So what you see here, again, one minor change in the uh, application properties, and we're good to go. And we've built an image. We didn't push the image yet. So as of now, the image is only available locally. Uh, but uh, it's already a good start, right? So Docker images, and then we do a grab, and then we say demo, demo Docker, and it should be fine. So ignore this for now. Again, this will be test, and uh, concentrate on, on the size of the image. So right now we have a 30, 366 megabyte large image, and we want to change it. We know that with the LVM support, um, we can, and, and Quark is supporting it, of course, uh, we could um, easily build up a native image. First, just to demonstrate that it really works, right? So we didn't build just an image. So we'll run this image on the port 88, it will map the port, and uh, we'll see what happens. And uh, so the startup time was okay, under one second, which is already a huge deal for everybody used to starting uh, up the enterprise-grade application service, service locally. 
And again, let me change to the live profile and let us do a curl localhost 8080 because it's the map port and do the standard hello. And we got a response, so no surprise there at least. Right, so that worked, which is cool. And it worked uh, with the first attempt right away if you edit it out. But now again, back to the native imaging, um, right? So let us do a quick thing. So I'll just try to update the version of the um, of the application. So I'll just increase it to 101 snapshot uh, with a simple maven command line. And then the only thing we have to set is we want to build native images. So for this, we just go back to the application properties and we configure the native container build set to true. And I have to configure it like this because uh, otherwise uh, the version of of, of the libc doesn't necessarily match what I have on my local machine. So with the container build, I'm always on the safe side. And with a clean package, right? So the same size once again. This time it might take a tick longer because building a native image requires a bit more time. And, uh, but in the end, it usually pays off and we'll see. All right, the only thing I forgot to do is, of course, to start it in the native profile. That time, I know what I did wrong. Um, so we'll have to wait till the native image is being built. And uh, once it's there, uh, we'll see a two dramatic effects, hopefully dramatic, but they're usually dramatic, again, for the guys coming from the outside of the enterprise world. So. Let's uh, give Graal the out time to do some pre shaking, remove all the classes and methods we don't need in our application. And uh, then we'll be able to see what advantages it brings. So, still taking a while. Beware of this if you configure the native builds as part of your CI CD pipeline. And I always think of the sort of the slow native build and the dev mode as, as like two sides of the same coin, which is that if when you do so much build time optimization, you don't want to be doing that every time you want to do an inner loop. So then you have to have the really good dev mode and the really good live reload as a complement to doing the build time exactly. um, optimization. It's also to restore the, the restaurant business, right? Because he, uh, <laughs> yeah. the three dinner, men, three dinner was going out the window with corpus, but he would bring it back. So yeah, I mean, I think we're probably even in a native build, you're probably at like maybe an espresso, but still, <laughs> he's definitely giving some trade. So let's do a grab again. Uh, first thing that we observe is, as mentioned previously, or given a sneak peek previously, is a, a much lesser footprint, memory footprint of the Docker image, which might help, in particular if you have a paid by volume Docker registry somewhere out in the cloud and you do a lot of continuous integration. Um, so that's one part. Second part is, of course, uh, so previously we had 0.7, if I'm not mistaken, uh, for the startup. Let's do it again. Wow, what is it, right? So we are under around about one, no, two hundredths of a second, and the application is there. And yeah, it's obviously the same stack trace, so I will not bother um, trying to curl against it. But yes, try it out. It usually pays off, in particular if you try to um, scale horizontally. Cool. So again, this is usually a huge surprise for people that have never worked with LVM previously or think that's way too complicated, which it is, which is, which it, which it is. But as a consumer of it, given the great integration into Quarkos, we are good to go and we don't have to make much thoughts about it. Um, 
depending on on the on the extensions we use and on all the additional libraries that we use, of course, because then we might get into trouble having to write those exclusions for the LVMs ourselves. But that's rarely the case if we, if we stick to supported official extensions, right? Okay, <clears throat> next thing. So again, Docker is something that it has gained great acceptance among the developers. Not everybody, but it's getting there. But Kubernetes is sometimes in new unknown list. And uh, it is nice that uh, you have provided some great support for this. And particularly also the support to be able to generate the descriptors, which I greatly enjoyed. So this time, again, um, it's mostly two previous extensions plus the Kubernetes extension on top. Um, just generating it again, selected extensions, love the feature. Um, we see what we have to push there. And uh, I'm using um, micro Kubernetes, so it's a micro setup. On my local machine, so I'm not using any uh, any provider right now. Um, so that's why, since I have to deploy the uh, my application into Kubernetes, I have to make sure that the uh, Docker image is getting pushed to the internal registry so that Kubernetes can access it. So again, I'm using micro kates on, on my machine, so I have a local host 32,000, and it's already pre-configured. So let's open our old friend code, or a new friend code, I'd rather say. I'm more used uh, to IntelliJ, but for purposes of the presentation, I decided to give it a try. Uh, right, so we need to configure a couple of things. First, um, you've seen this here already, so, or rather that we built images, you've seen it. Oh, in this time we also push the image. Uh, and uh, I have to configure the registry and uh, I have to make sure that it will try to push because Quarkus is all about security, I guess. And it will uh, prevent me from pushing into insecure registries. Uh, so I have to configure it extra. Uh, okay, so that. Well, let's try to do this again. So what will happen in the background, of course, it will try to build up an image, obviously, it will try to push it to my local registry and it will obviously complain that it's not a secure registry. And uh, it will also generate the Kubernetes descriptors for me. So here it's complaining and let's have a look at uh, what's been generated for me as well. So we go into target, uh, we go into Kubernetes, and we find ourselves a Kubernetes YAML, which basically contains a deployment and a service. I will not dive into the details of, of these descriptors for now, but the name is okay, proper, and the version is proper, and it will always try to fetch uh, the pool to pull the, the, the proper image. And that's why I had to configure the registry. Right, so with that said, I think we're ready. Uh, I'll just keep couple, get all, and you see there is nothing there yet. Um, so um, that's not a setup. And uh, now we can try to create a couple of things. Of course, the deployment and the service as stated in the Kubernetes YAML. Voila, it goes oh, well, oh well. And if I do a keep couple, get all. Uh, what we observe here is obviously a deployment with a replica set and a pod with one uh, instance of it running one out of one and a service that we can access. Um, I can didn't configure any ingress or hosts here. So we'll have to fall back to the good old pod folding. And uh, yes, I should have made this one the default. Uh, yes, so that's not that difficult. Cube couple port forward, and I will just forward uh, the service demo Kubernetes, this one here, onto port 1990, uh, and it will get mapped to the port 80 as specified in the generated descriptor. 
So good to go. And uh, let's, sorry, let's put it vertically this time and change the profile for better readability and do our good old friend curl. Hello. And it worked. So it did handle the connection for the port 9090 and it did uh, bring us back the standard string uh, that was generated by the REST is a reactive extension, which is a hello from REST is a reactive. And again, whenever you talk to people that had no experience, no hands-on Kubernetes, and you say, we'll do Kubernetes de uh, development, and they say, well, it's too complicated. It's not. I mean, it is, but you have tooling to support you. So don't be afraid of it. That would be my recommendation. It does simplify a couple of things. Right. And again, so here we already start building the aha effect and the wow effect for the newcomers. And uh, now is the time to bring it all together. So till now, I've shown the hot code replacement, how easy it is to generate a Docker image, how we can release Docker image in Kubernetes. And now it's time for the great finale, I'd say. And this is the remote dev, one of the features which... So just, just before you go to remote dev, yes. just, there's one thing I think people maybe missed is how little you actually have to... Like you, you did a lot of things, but that was for your local setup, but you... The, your JIP to, to Docker was a one-line change, and your Kubernetes was a one-line change. And you just you use kubectl to deploy. Yes, exactly. And Let's keep the helm for now. Yeah. Is there a reason why you didn't use Quarkus? Because uh, Quarkus can also do the deploy, but uh... yes, there is a reason. So basically, I come from a project where we also had Helm on top of the, of the whole setup. And we also had a custom-made uh, CI/CD pipeline based on, on a couple of standard tools, uh, but uh, the networking was pretty difficult, and a couple of um, edge cases, or the way it was set up, was so difficult that we were just building up Helm charts. We were pushing the Docker, uh, Docker images into the registry, then we'd use Scopio to copy them to OpenShift, and it would be oh deployed by some kind of weird magic um, onto OpenShift. That's why we don't deploy directly from Quarkus. We didn't deploy directly from Quarkus. And that's also a more bare bone, closer to the roots, yeah. from my point of view, a way of doing things. Yeah. Um, yeah. And not to be, not to get over, not to get yeah. new, newcomers overwhelmed with all those new technology. I just try to s demonstrate the basics, usually, sure. and uh, try to build it up. From from the very beginning to to the top, and, and that's I think that's a good point is that you know Quarkus does a lot of stuff magically with all of that, but it also interacts with the real world of Helm charts and complicated networks and whatever. So you can kind of dial up how much magic you want and how how little magic you want. So uh, all is perfectly fine. Cool. Well, let's go back to some more magic. <laughs> so more magic. And that is, again, the magic that I personally like to have, but I don't like to use, uh, which is the remote app, uh, which is if you have heard of Jenkins X or developing directly in the cloud is basically a thing. We have used it on one occasion in, in our project. And uh, yeah, to cut the sto long story short, I'll just demonstrate and then uh, I'll also pinpoint a couple of use cases where it may be useful from my point of view. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's a feature that uh, might bring you into trouble if it's not used carefully. This with all the features, I guess, but this one in particular. So again, let's, uh, so developing in the cloud directly. Uh, live developing in the cloud. So we've seen, again, hot code replacement to come back to it. We've seen Docker and Kubernetes. Uh, let's try to combine things together and uh, get hot code replacement in the cloud. And this is what basically for me, the remote dev is all about. 
Um, so we have to configure a couple of things. Um, so this one we've seen, we have, once we build the application, we need to push it to the proper registry, right? And then uh, we need to add a couple of extras. So we have to make the jar mutable, which is one of the configuration properties described on, on the guide. We have to provide it with a, with a reload password and then we have to provide a reload URL. And um, once we build the whole thing, and uh, I'll do this from the command line as well, clean package. And uh, I know that this is not a good thing, but just to save some time, uh, given uh, the timeline right now, I will just skip the test for now. Of course, I would never ever do this uh, in real life, but just for the demo purposes. Uh, I'd like to do it. And uh, yeah, so basically uh, we have, we are generating the image. We have generated the image, which is nice. And we also got generated a Kubernetes YAML. And uh, this time I'd like to change it to pre So I'll just create a new folder here and I will go to target. Sorry. Target Kubernetes, Kubernetes YAML, and I will just put it in here. And uh, there is one last thing that we have to change in order for it uh, to be working uh, fine with the remote app. And this is a small environment setting, which is Quarkus launch dev mode. So that even in the cloud, or in this case, in Kubernetes, we are using the dev mode, because normally we don't use it, right? Normally we use everything in production, so, which is good. So what I've done here is I've just edited, uh, edited a new environment variable, Quarkus launch dev mode, which is set to true in this particular case. And we're good to go. So, the old drill, we do a kube cuddle, create minus f. This time we have our source main Kubernetes, Kubernetes YAML. And by the way, so yeah. the steps you're showing now is to one of the weakness of remote devs that there are, for security reasons, you have this these uh, different levels of, oh, you have to set the, have a key, a password, and you have to have a, a explicit one to, to, to run. We are discussing to simplify this. But, yes, uh, what to? Well, uh, it will be that you don't have to, um, uh, basically we could make a command as a Quarkus remote dev mode that that sets up this uh, two-way password. Um, so so that the remote dev will deploy the application and set it up correctly. Um, mm -hmm. and, and you should be fine. But again, that will require you to use Quarkus magic because we have control then of of the application properties and this community YAML. Uh, so it just means that you can have to run remote dev uh, with a single command instead of doing these steps. Um, but the steps are there for security reasons. So it's kind of like a yes. Yeah. So let me check. I think I've done the edit in the wrong. Yes, obviously in the wrong. Uh, window of the BS code, which is bad. Don't you just love invention-based languages? <laughs> so, um, just have to make sure that it didn't create anything else. So let's do a delete. Right, and then do it, do it again, and this time it works. I mean, once you start editing the right files, it works automatically. Uh, Cube cuddle get uh, get all. Just to check again. Right. So what we have here is again a remote dev pod, a service deployment with a replica set. So all standard things that we've uh, already seen, and uh, nothing weird so far. So what we'll do, obviously, is again a keep cuddle port forward. And this time it's not the demo Kubernetes, 
This time it's demo without def. And uh, let's do a curl, right? Um, our own good old friend curl. And do a hello. So it did work. So now let's do a weird thing. Let's do a Quarkus remote dev. So normally you would use Quarkus a column dev, but now we'll do the Quarkus dev part, and I will already prepare a split terminal for this one. And I'll change the profile for the creator good. Um, right, so what we are going to do right now, we are in the remote dev and we have our creating resource. And let's say remote dev rules sometimes. And do a curl again. So what you see in the cabinet in the background already which I find extremely cool is that it computed, kind of computed the new drive and sent it to the remote server. So if we do a local host 9090 slash hello, that is reloading. Come on. Yeah. Now it's there. So we get a remote dev rules. Normally it is running way faster than this one, but uh, yeah, presenter effect again, I guess. Again, your local host here is your Kubernetes cluster, right? Yes, exactly. So I have a Kubernetes cluster for my local host. I was preparing for the um, Kubernetes application developer exam. So it was a good, nice thing to have a cluster <laughs> locally instead of yep. Paying uh, for some some instance on, on out there, it worked well, um, right? So a couple of use cases where this kind of development is uh, advantages. So we had one where we had to develop in the cloud directly because our machines were not capable of running the whole microservice landscape of our system. So we would just deploy parts of our application to dedicated namespace. And we would be have the option to edit it directly, and just to quickly check a couple of things. Another option where it was really or could have been very helpful if we would uh, be allowed to do so. Um, in the beginning of the project, the pipelines were taking hours to complete, and um, instead be ha having the possibility to deploy the jar directly while testing a couple of things with the real data. Uh, would have been real advantages, but having proper pipelines in place is more advantages anyway, yeah. which we yeah. got in the end. But for quick hacking, it is really cool. It is really cool. And again, Jenkins X, where you develop directly in the cloud or using some, some tool like Scaffold, where you sync the code and let the cloud take care of the rest and then it will automatically process the whole thing. Uh, on uh, cloud-based machines or IDEs or on uh, very slow machines or not so powerful machines locally, it make uh, might make a lot of sense. Right. This part, this section, this demo concludes the whole code code replacement part. And I hope it was insightful for you as well. Close, clear, and change directory. Because it is something really an eye opener for people who haven't worked with it previously. Okay. I hope I didn't miss any questions in the chat. No, we have a more generic one. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, so this is only in his out of context, but he's asking about. Uh, in your case, we're making Quark extensions to make things better, uh, except for create your own extensions, which he feels is not enough. So, Holly, I know, I know you have that as a near and dear uh, topic. So maybe you want to cover it. Yeah, I've um, I've brought up a few links that I think are useful, and hopefully, we'll paste them into the chat as well. Um, but if we can, we share my screen. Yes, where is your screen? There we go. 
Yay, cool. Um, so if you, I think, I think some of these are um, the ones that you were already looking at earlier, Aurelia, sorry, Aurelia. <laughs> Aurelia. Um, but if you on Quarkus now, if you go to extensions, there's the extension catalog um, that we showed at the beginning, but there's also create extensions. Um, so that takes you to a guide, which is a big guide. It's quite a deep guide. Um, it has a lot in there. Um, well, not too much in there, but but there's a lot in there. Um, if you want something a bit more digestible, there's the building my first extension, which I think is the one that you were talking about. So this is sort of the hello world of extensions. Um, and I sometimes think like we need something in the middle, like not my first extension, but building my second extension. Um, and I keep thinking I'm going to write it and I haven't yet. Um, but we have a ton of good blogs out there. Um, so you need to assemble them, but then once you do that, there's really good content. Um, so Guillaume has written a bunch of blogs where he sort of talks through some use cases that you might want to do with an extension. So for example, if we have a dependency and there's some problematic bytecode in the dependency or we want to improve the bytecode in the dependency, um, he's got these two blogs that are sort of both relate to different kinds of things that you could do with bytecode. So solving problems and one and solving problems two. Um, there's a for sort of more of a tutorial of just kind of, okay, I'm going to do an, make an extension and it's going to do something more useful than the Hello World extension, but I don't need all of those docs. Um, this is a really good blog um, by Bennett Schultz. And we actually, we had him on Quarkus Insights and he was talking through what he'd done. And I was thinking, this sounds really familiar. And then I realized it was because I'd worked through his blog step by step and, and taken it as a tutorial. So um, this is really good as sort of a tutorial for... I want to do use an extension. Here's the steps that I would go through to write it. Here's some of the capabilities that I might be able to do. Um, more generally, one, once you're sort of in the middle of writing the extension, good reference is the list of all Quarkus build items. So if you search for Quarkus build items, you'll find this. Um, and you can see there's a lot in here. But build items, they're a little bit like an SPI for writing extensions. So in general, how extensions work is they um, declare build steps and each build step will consume and produce build items. And what, depending what build items you produce and what build items you consume, that will shape the functionality of your extension. So a lot of tasks that you might want to do in your extension, like rewriting um, bytecode or like here, creating an application archive or reading an application archive, those there's almost always there's an existing build item that's been written for that use case. And so you can just pull in that build item. Um, but to figure out if there's an existing build item, you browse this list. So those are the sort of the, the resources that I tend to use when I'm writing extensions. Right, very nice. I, I put the links in the chat too. So. Uh... Should be there, but yeah, it looks so we get this question a lot about kind of next level of extension writing. So uh, it's good to get it covered. Yeah, we should write a how to build, how to write your second second extension, as you said. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, we've got a conversation sort of going on on Zulip because um because someone's volunteered, and so we just need to to make it happen. Awesome. Cool. I say, have you played with writing your own extension, or maybe just uh, to use Not it? yet. Uh, I've mean, I've uh, did some contribution to small uh, to small write reactive messaging. I did a contribution to Dev Services recently, yeah. but uh, I wasn't able to find an entry point for a good extension till now, because uh, the one library I tried to advertise in the beginning, uh, Database Writer, it is it doesn't need an extension. Let's say. It is already very good usable, very well usable for um, as, as is, because it's based on CDI. And uh, yes, so if you have any ideas, which could be a first a first good issue or a good first issue, um, just tag it along or label it and send it over to me. I'm glad to dive into it again. I like hacking, uh, hacking the code. Well, I, I found one today, so if you're bored, I can give you that one. I am bored. I mean, I'm not bored, but... <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell his boss. 
<laughs> it is it is an interesting topic, and uh, it would give me certainly give me more insights okay. in uh, how Quark goes no, yeah, this, this one is actually a very simple one. It's like um, you know the service Ngrok. No, like service where you can be local, and then it sets up a terminal for you. So we already have an extension for it called Quark Quarkus and Ngrok. Um, but it has, so it's really nice, but it, it requires you to have a, a login for NGROC now to, to work well. Uh, and, but it turns out there's a new thing. Uh, so Cloudflare came up with a Cloudflare tunnel, which does the same thing, but it works even if you not sign in. Uh, and so if you look at the NGROC extension, you can basically replicate what it does, I think, for Cloudflare, and that'll be a nice. So what, what it now is to do is if you just, Add an extension, you can basically make your local machine. It's like available to anyone. So it's the, it's the reverse of remote dev. It's local dev done in a dangerous place where everyone can access it. Um, but it's very useful for. <laughs> <laughs> I love the way you've sold that. <laughs> it's uh, the the use case is uh, you you want to access from your phone or you want to demo it to your boss. It gets it generates a URL that. You shouldn't share unless you want people to access your machine. And then it's going over a secure tunnel back to you. Um, so and it, it's very nice if you know if you do like a, a GitHub uh, automation or something else, uh, this add this extension and then you have it and it's enabled only in dev mode, not in production, but uh, it allows you to do these kind of fun things. So, uh, so yeah, that, that was one. That was Sounds fun. like a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, ping, me, ping me on Zolip and I'll be happy to, to sure. have a look into it. Cool. Yes, right. should we continue? Yeah, sure. We still have a couple of topics, and I mean, I promised okay. 10 things. Uh, I only shown uh, four. So now four. Okay, four. Yeah, you have three minutes. So I'll, <laughs> all right, we'll continue. We'll be. Uh, I don't have a hot stop. Holly, are you okay to continue? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I'll let it go short and uh, maybe. Uh, Cut a couple of edges, but uh, yeah, I'm good to go. Will you pull up the screen again? I'll do, uh, yeah, if I can find the button, there we go. Cool. So, right, I've already mentioned small reactive messaging, uh, and uh, I've been recently working on some IoT projects. And uh, what I found very, very cool about it is that you can combine a lot of sources and things coming from different or using different protocols uh, and then use the same paradigm to process the messages. And this is what the next demo is all about. Uh, it is about combining MQTT and Kafka messages or topics and, and records, whatever you call them. It's, it's difficult to, to find a term that suits them all right now. So let's change to demo reactive messaging and open it. And I promise I'll try to do it fast, although I had heard that uh, I'm not supposed to try to speak faster. But I hope you will try to slow me down if it will be way too. Take, take, take your time. Down. It's better to do it right than. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You're totally right. So I will just uh, create a small processor that takes uh, messages out of MQTT topic and then puts them into a Kafka topic and does some transformation on the string processor. And uh, yes, I've already tried to prepare some code so that we can save some time. And I will just explain what the code does. And uh, first I have to yeah, just remove Lombok because we don't really need it here, given the short time span that we have. And it's a string. Algebraic. So again, uh, for those of you who don't know what uh, small array record messaging is, go take a look. It is very, very cool. It allows for combining incoming and outgoing channels. Uh, it allows for combining, as of now, I think, Kafka, Camel, MQTT, even JMS, which we had uh, a bit of trouble with uh, a couple of years back. But uh, from the from the paradigm, it's, it's slightly different than, than everything else. 
So I think it's okay. So what we'll do here is we get some bytes out of an MQTT topic and we'll just build a string out of it. And then what we'll do is we'll produce a new Kafka record, which has the string as key and the duplicated string as value. And of course, for it to, in order for it to work, we have to change a couple of things or to configure a couple of things rather. Uh, let's do this one. So we need to specify the connections. So I'll just drop this one, delete. So what I'm configuring here is first one, the incoming topic string in based on the small while MQTT extension. And then I'm also using the small array Kafka for the outgoing topic. And uh, I will also like to have a new file, Docker Compose. And for those of you who have seen the previous introduction, or well, the four previous demos should be by now familiar enough with Docker and hopefully also Docker Compose to be able to dive also and like the Docker Compose, which basically allows you to bootstrap the whole development environment locally given that you have support for Docker or Podman, right? Um, which is also a great alternative. So here in this Docker Compose, I have a zookeeper for the Kafka, and uh, I also have a Mosquito, which is a MQTT broker. That's it, if I'm not uh, mistaken. So what we have to do right now is, we can write a thing. Uh, we'll have to... Er don't, don't we have support for both Kafka and Mosquito in? Uh, let's, yes, you do. But this is the topic of the next demo. At the time okay. point of writing this one, you didn't have support for Mosquito. I'm, I'm jumping ahead. Okay, good. Yeah, sorry. Um, yes, uh, uh, that's, a, that's a great point. Uh, I should have mentioned it. At the time point of writing it, which is already a couple of months back, you didn't have support for, for Mosquito yet. And this is exactly the dev service that I contributed to. Um, yeah. So it was nice, but again, uh, there is there are many app services, but uh, not for every single one of them there is a dev service. Uh, and I will show you an example of it later, uh, which is maybe a bit cumbersome or weird that it's still in use, but FTP <laughs> or SFTP um, is uh, also sometimes in use. And uh, there's no dev service for it yet, which I might want to contribute as well. So for now, we'll need to start the application. And uh, what we'll do, it will automat automatically and automatically connect against all those brokers. Unless I've missed a couple of things. Oh yeah. I have deleted the, the class, but I haven't deleted the test, which is a silly thing to do. Now we're there. Now we're talking business. And split horizontally, split vertically, uh, change the profile. So what I'll do now is I will connect to both the Kafka broker and uh, the, the MQTT broker, and I will send a couple of messages. So let's try it out. Uh, can you zoom in just a little bit? The fun is quite. Yes, short. sure. So, okay. so Docker exec MPI Docker. We have Kafka one, and then the bin bash. We are in the sub, and uh, what I'll do now is I'll start the Kafka console consumer with bootstrap server equals to my local host, and the topic name is string out, exactly the one that I configured previously. We are listening. 
And is this okay? I hope so. Again, here I want to connect with the MQTT broker. And Docker Mosquito. And again, start a shell there. Oh, yeah. It only has a simple shell. And what over here is a mosquito prop. So I want to publish a message in this string in, which is our incoming uh, channel. And the message will be hello. And you see it got duplicated. So of course we could do more or try to write some loops, but basically you have the full power and the full support of the small array reactive messaging at your hand to combine uh, different things and sources, which is a thing I really like because yeah, once the people come from an enterprise world and are used to combining and JMS and manually having to download each message, they are thrilled to see this support of messaging. I'll just exit here, exit here, and this basically concludes the uh, reactive messaging demo. Of course, it's nothing uh, what uh, Clement um, would have done with reactive messaging. But again, this is a very, very um, entry level kind of demonstration. Um, so for anybody who hasn't worked with a small with reactive messaging or haven't combined different channels before, or isn't is used to writing a lot of boilerplate code, this is indeed an eye opener. Let's close this one. Right. Next up, we have uh, is, as you mentioned previously, dev services. So, of course, having uh, these Docker Compose things, and I'll just go back there. Active messaging uh, source main uh, Docker. Composed. Now, having those things is very, very cool. Just want to uh, doing some testing. So, is there a better way? Yes, of course. And these are the dev services, which are containers that are being automatically started for you. Let's see how it works. Uh, right. Give me a second. So what we'll do right now is we'll generate an application uh, for demonstrating uh, the app services. And uh, to make an example of it, or make the example even prettier, I decided to go ahead with the uh, reactive database drivers. In this case, Postgres. Let's open thing. And uh, we'll just. Uh, how much more time do we have, guys? Because I have a lot of apparently. Oh, we hope we're over time, but uh, go, go ahead. We will. Uh, people can watch the recording. So. Okay. Cool. So. A couple of things uh, we have to take care of about now is uh, this time I would really like to have longer. So I'll just put it here. And uh, uh, what I'll do is I'll generate a simple entity. We all love uh, them to do applications, right? So I will generate a small entity for the TDs. Uh, let me start up to file to do Java. And uh, good thing I have to have to type it on in by myself right now. And let's also create a repository, which is a panache repository in this case, to do repository. And uh, this is just to make 
all the people working with Spring Data a bit more comfortable, but not requiring them to use the Spring Data extension. Um, right, and then a small resource, which will do following. So let me create to do resource. Um, which will basically do following. It will inject it to the repository and it will return an UMI, which is a part of small array packet messaging of all the to-dos that we have. And uh, you'll see that I first try to fetch the to-dos asynchronously and then I put a lock and then I map it to collect the text and I put it out to string and then it is being returned to the requester. To make it work, uh, we have to do a couple of things. Uh, we need to configure the application properties. So we have to enable those FPS services, right? And I don't think we need this one anymore. So Those or some other configuration done there. Let's just a little bit away. So I enable the dev services for the data source. I provide the kind of the database, which is a Postgres, and I still have to provide a small seed file for the uh, database. So I'll do first SQL and I'll insert a couple of here, so just using a minute sequence, I'll insert idea text into my to do's. And with this, I think we are good to go. Let's start the application. And uh, wait for it to come up. And what you have been observing shortly in the in the log was uh, the bootstrapping of a Postgres database. So just in case you missed it, you can always go and say, help me with the dev services and then show all the dev services. And what it will show you in the console that it's bootstrapped a Postgres SQL, which has been up for 19 seconds. And uh, it was also executing the initial seed of the database based on the pilot we've provided. And if we were to uh, split it, change the profile, scroll up, and execute a curl, localhost, it to do. Uh, We get the to-dos, and uh, what you also see is the reactiveness of the, of the driver. So we first put out the lock, and on the band it did execute the query. So it was kind of lazy loaded from the database. Again, to remind you um, about how the resource looked like, it first fetched the uni, then it printed the message, and then it done the map. So this one, this part is kind of lazy. Again, wasn't to demonstrate that we have support for reactive uh, database drivers, although we, or Quarkus does, but more to demonstrate that you don't necessarily need to provide your own Docker Compose files or Docker, separate Dockers for that matter, if you have uh, support for dev services and support for the specific features. Right, cool thing. And again, MQTT is there. Go give it a try. If uh, there are bugs on it, I'm happy to fix them. And one, one I'll mention here is that you sh the first demo was, hey, use Star Compose for setting everything up. And then the second demo was use dev, dev services. But you can actually do a mix. So you could have your service be some of it being managed by Docker, and the other will be, uh, sorry, with your Star Compose, and another one with dev services. Yes. The only thing that does. It's dev service just kicks in. If you haven't configured anything, we will we will activate it. So exactly. We'll we'll use it whatever we were used to. Yeah. 
Right, totally. Uh, the next one is a bit more lengthy, and so I'm considering to drop everything that I've done till now here. Uh, and uh, luckily, I think I've prepared branch uh, where all the things are already pre-generated and uh, we can go into one of my favorite topics testing so we don't want uh, so that you don't have to observe me copy pasting and creating the code but instead we go into the demo directly so testing is a huge part and a huge deal of everybody develop uh, every developer's life right and I'm really happy to see great support of testing in, in Quarkus. And a couple of features that I like the most, or one of them, is, is, is test profiles. So what I've brought in today is a simple resource, which basically does, not, does nothing uh, uh, outside of just copying a file. Uh, in this case, it's ZSHRC to a, an upload directory somewhere on, on the SFTP server. Uh, and I want to test it. So the question is, so unfortunately there is no um, dev service yet, but uh, how do we generally test in Quarkus? And for people that are not used to integration testing or are not so into TDD and are not testing all the edge cases, uh, Quarkus has some great news. So what it does, so there is a test, and what I'll do for now, I'll just disable everything that happened previously. So this is what we'll do normally, right? So we have a Quarkus test, which is an integration test, which will bootstrap the um, instance of our application up front, or component test, depending on, on, the, on the term that you're using. Um, and what I want to do is that prior to the test, there was no there, nothing there, no, no file. And then rest assured, the great library, once I do the post, uh, on, on my route that uh, I get a specific message that it was so that the file was put there. And uh, once I check the SFTP server, that it's that the file that I was intending to transfer is there. So if I would run it as of now, uh, we'll give it some time to bootstrap the whole thing, uh, we would obviously fail. Why obviously? Because there is nothing to accept the connection, right? So for this, we have some great support uh, in Quarkus. Uh, and I will start with the, with the test resources first. So basically what test resources in Quarkus are, um, those are additional resources, again. Uh, and in this case, I'm using test container that, that, that have a certain life cycle. Uh, which are being usually bootstrapped uh, before the whole application testing begins and would uh, be tiered down once the testing ends. And they also are greatly combinable with the test container. Um, since there's no dev server still now, I fall back to standard uh, generic uh, container. For SFTP, there is a very small, tiny Docker image which I can use. I provide some configuration, I do some uh, mapping, and then what I can do is I can override the configuration of the environment, of the test environment, so to say, with uh, the values that I get from test containers. And uh, for the stopping, I just stop the, the, um, um, the, the, the generic container, right? So let's try it out. Uh, our test is here, so I will just try to um, add the Quarkus test resource and uh, we'll try the test again. And this time it should work. Um, uh, but this, uh, but using test resources, at least from uh, based on my experience in, in the project, so right now we have a green test, uh, has a major drawback that um, independent of whether a certain test is annotated with Quarkus test resource or not. Uh, like example here, like this, this dummy test. What it will do, no matter what, 
uh, whether if this test is unupdated or not, it will also bootstrap the test resource because Quarkus has no way of knowing that you don't need it here. So you see it was it started this control container rook, and then it also bootstrapped the SFTP server, which is not necessarily a thing that we want. We want more control about our of our tests. And uh, this is where Quarkus test profiles come in play. And they come in very handy. Uh, that is one of the things I really like uh, in the door about Quarkos is uh, the ability to configure test profiles, where for purposes of, of today's demonstration, uh, I will limit myself to configuring the test resources. And if we do so, uh, so if we annotate the test with the test profile instead of Quarkus test, then we still get all the test resources annotated. But this time, yeah, so I can run it and it will run through. But this time it won't, so it does start, yeah, the test is green. Um, it does start the Alpine, uh, so the SFTP Alpine container uh, for this test, but for the W test it won't, which is a very nice thing uh, if you want to test different scenarios. For example, yeah, now it's much faster, right? No SFTP server bootstrap now. And this is extremely helpful if you want to test different scenarios. So imagine you want to test what happens if one of the backing services is not there. If you want to test uh, it with a timeout, if you want to test it uh, with a different profile or a different user, different credentials, uh, it, is, it is really, really powerful. So give it a try. Uh, it is sometimes very advisable to use them, if uh, not always, because again, uh, Quarkus test resources is just bootstrapped all the time. All right. Uh, the only thing I didn't show till now, which is also a major thing, and which is getting a major revamp and refactoring uh, in the upcoming version, uh, is uh, Quarkus Dev UI, right, guys? You do provide a second version of it in Quarkus. Yes, more pictures. Where developers can even provide their own extensions. Am I right? No. We're still live, aren't we? We right, are, yeah. yeah. I lost yeah. sound. I, I was just about to check my audio. I thought it was I just me. I lost mine. Sorry. Uh, okay. But I'm here. So, yes, we have the dev UI. To, so, in the old dev UI, things are static. You could, well, static as in the front end was uh, basically server side queue templates. Um, and you could add your own uh, if you wanted to. Uh, so, you extended to contribute other stuff. But we've uh, done enough uh, a refresh where the front end is now more. Uh, I forgot what it's called based on. It's web components with lit. You, lit, lit, yes, lit components. Sorry, that's it. Um, that allows us to basically it, it. You can use more traditional front end stuff to be more advanced. Not that we. I think every extension should do that, but uh, so basically, what you can do is do more fancy stuff, but. Also, uh, you can literally just, you know, extend could just be return a list of properties, key values you want to show. That's it. Uh, before you had to write some HTML, now you don't. Um, so yeah, so it's basically just a, a revamp of, uh, of the dev UI being more, I don't know, what would you call it, extendable, uh, composable than it was before. Very cool. Dynamic. Yeah. To, yeah. So let's, let's stick with the more static for now. Dev UI a great tool for the developers for the local development. So one of the things that I use the most is config editor, of course. If you want to change some runtime properties, you can do it on the fly. Uh, what, I'm, what if you have uh, problems analyzing why a certain injection is not working as expected, give a bins a look. Uh, generally, what I also like about it, it provides you plugin points for every extension that you're using. So I'm not using many extensions right now. So it's a bit sparse. 
And you also have integrated Kafka UI, if I'm not mistaken, which is a very handy tool if you want to really send a couple of records uh, for quick testing. It's, it's, really, it's really good. Um, notice one final thing um, on Quarkus 2.16.5, which might be almost the most recent version. I'm not sure you, you, you develop at very high pace, uh, not always up to date. But um, oh, Quarkus, sorry? I'm saying it's close enough to be in the last, latest release, yes. Okay, but uh, Quarkus is coming up, uh, Quarkus 3 is coming up with uh, some major updates and uh, give it a try and try to upgrade to it. It is really easy, which we also like. I've uh, done a small brown bag session on JBank internally, which is why I liked. But by the way, I've uh, got to know JBank also from from your kind of mailing list and subscribe for Quarkus changes. But uh, basically what it does, it just executes a script based on open rewrite to update your dependencies, your imports, your POM XML to the most latest version that is published on the Quarkus 3 channel. And in, in, in uh, I think, CR1, hopefully, <laughs> which comes out next week, we will... Uh... Uh, this will be part of the CLI, so you don't have to have uh, JBang as a separate thing. Um, okay. But yeah, no, the JBang is, is perfectly fine and valid. There's no problem with it. It's just that uh, uh, we are working on making it part of the Quark CLI, uh, so you don't have Yeah, So it, it fits in, uh, basically. Okay. That's good to know. Um, so basically, if I would now start Quark with that, there are a couple of changes, which I'll uh, quickly demonstrate in the end. But uh, just to demo this part here, Let's refresh it, and voila, we have a seamlessly upgraded uh, Quarkus application to Alpha 300 Alpha 5. And yeah, with respect to the changes, whatever needed to be changed uh, got changed. Yeah, so what, what you did is what we hope most people will just have to do for the updates. Yes. Um, so whatever was, but, uh, <laughs> whatever see. was Javax previously is now Jakarta. Uh, Pom XML got updated uh, with the yeah with the proper platform version. And everything worked smooth this time. So yes, sorry to interrupt you. Sure. But but wait, did you did you didn't you say just upgrade? I'm just surprised they picked Alpha 5 and not the better. I'm wondering if that's a bug. I did the upgrade, but it could be the case that, uh, uh, and I mean, I've done a fresh upgrade to Quarkus 3. Yeah. So either either the Alpha Alpha 6 is or, or Beta 1 is not published, or I have some flaw in my setup. Oh, it's probably just using, uh, maybe it's using a cast version of what was there. Yes, but, uh, could yeah. be. Anyway. Again, I was... Preparing yeah. it for a couple of weeks, days, weeks now. Yeah. Right. And this concludes uh, the features that I like to demonstrate. It was. If you want to show the dev UI, you can just, if you just run this one, Quarkus, run this in Quarkus Dev. Sure. And then you go to uh, Dev, uh, where it says Q slash Dev, you just go to Q slash Dev dash UI. Right. Yeah. I thought of this one. Let's go to localhost, data energy, use the dev UI, good app. And then yes. you just remove the slash and then uh, dash uh, UI. Good? Yes. And that's the new one. Cool. Uh, well, it did see Alpha 5, so there's stuff missing here, but uh, yeah. I'm not sure if any, you don't have any extensions that are nice or nice, sorry, that doesn't have, that has the, these things in, but yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. They all nice. Yes. Uh, I could have tried don't have a UI part to them, yeah. Uh, but yeah, and we will have, you're trying to get, just after Easter, uh, we're trying to get Philip, who did most of the current work of this, he will demo the dev UI and all its glory. Uh, but yeah, you can try this out now, and I think. <laughs> Did we change the defaults? Or maybe that's just in main. But yeah, it's a big.
basically we are moving towards that this will be the default in, in Corcus 3. Uh, but yeah, that's the, that's the new one. Cool. Yes. So that would be it from my side. Perfect. I'm sorry that it took a bit longer. It, <laughs> it, was, it was worth it. It was really good content. So you, I know we are on out of time, but you've been saying all nice things. And you said you just bug fix. So you, if there's any issue, just fix it in the PR. So everything is good. There's no anything that, that troubles you or have been challenging. Or is... uh, there is one thing, but I'm not sure whether you are directly responsible for it. Frankly speaking, um, there is one thing that has been bothering me for quite a long time already. I'll just uh, bring up the issues. And this is this one. I don't, don't want to brag about it too much, uh, but I've also submitted a pull request for the Open API generator that includes the gzip support for Quarkus. Um, and basically, this issue, I'd say, is the only one that stands in, in between using the whole thing productively. Because right now, there is a workaround. Um, for this, so this is very easy. Reactive is ignoring that. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure about reactive. We had it with the standard REST easy, and the problem was basically that, that this configuration was ignored by REST easy in Quarkus. Ah. It's been quite a while there for quite a while, but uh, there was an attempt to fix it uh, right after that is uh, once I submitted the, the whole thing. And I was really happy to, about the reaction time, but then it kind of froze because there was no quick fix for this. Oh, okay. That's... So yeah, if, if, you, if you can uh, ping the guys to fix this, I would be really, really That just looked like a miss, miss thing, right? Yeah. Well, uh... yeah, so the client, does, for some reason, doesn't honor this setting, which it should. Yes, exactly. And I mean, there, there is a way to circumvent this uh, by providing a copy of the GZIP decoding interceptor and then... Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure the client should honor the same as the server, but at least uh, you should have a setting to do it. But, uh, yeah. No, no. Uh, but yeah, can you put... You can copy the link to me and then we will take a look. I'm not promising anything. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not encouraging. <laughs> Go on, Parker, that's how I get you. At just fixed. But uh, sure, we'll see what it does. Uh, yeah. yeah, just uh, give me a second. I'll have to post it here. And again, uh, maybe the only last thing worth mentioning is the whole demo code and uh, also the snippets and, and the and, and and the story is available on GitHub, obviously. Uh, so if, if you have the link, I can, I can paste it in the chat. Then it yes, up. we'll yeah. do this in a second. So it is the slides and snippets for the Quarkus insights one, two, three, yeah. which is, I think, quite easy to find. Awesome. And this concludes, and I will stop my screen sharing if it's okay. Yeah, that's good. Perfect. I mean, we're almost on time. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I would say thank you for reaching out and, and showing, and uh, yeah, what you showed. Uh, is let's say the the the, the, the top ten and uh, well three or four of them is the one we normally do and then you had your own cut on them which was good uh, seeing people apply it in different ways which is a nice thing it fits everywhere so uh, at least almost cool Alexei Hoy any last famous words no All no good? I've I've been busily taking notes through the whole thing this is really 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 good yeah starting the writing extensions part two kind of thing yeah that too. <laughs> Awesome. Anyway, we'll sign off and uh, 